is when the opposite of the intended outcome happens. The classic example is in the short story Gift of the Magi, which you've probably read at some point or seen at some point, where the married couple has no money but they want to give each other presents. Yeah. She sells her long flowing hair to buy him a chain for his watch. He sells his watch to buy her combs for her hair. Christmas morning, they're like, oh, whoops. <laughs> situation five. <laughs> Um, it's the situation. thought that matters. In this case, not. <laughs> because they've been better off by this feature. So ultimately, that situational irony. Tragic irony from the Sophoclean sense is attempting to keep something from happening. But the attempt itself to keep that thing from happening is what causes that thing to happen. It's beautiful and poetic and so darn tragic. Oh, like in uh, Oedipus. It is like Macbeth, and it is taken from Oedipus. Think about it, right? Oedipus is living with who he believes to be his parents. The oracle says, you are going to kill your father and marry your mother. He says, no, I'm not. He leaves who he thinks are his parents. They weren't his actual parents. In leaving them and trying to thwart his fate, he kills his father and marries his mother, finds out later they were his actual parents. So his attempts to keep it from happening and bring it about, it's beautiful, poetic, tragic irony, and we call it Sophoclean because he so, so beautifully portrays it in his plays. We see this in uh, the third episode of Star Wars as well, Revenge of the Sith, yeah. right? He tries to keep his fate from happening by uh, joining the dark side, but joining the dark side is what causes his wife to die. So, irony is a little different than paradox. Paradox has elements of it, but paradox hinges upon what? The idea that it's impossible, but it's actually true. It's apparent contradiction. What? How? No. How does the wounded deer leave highest? That doesn't even make sense. But yet it's true. It's like in the book where it talked about the, uh, the satyr who had the guest come to his house. Do you remember why the satyr threw him out? Too ugly. <laughs> no. That'd be funny. <laughs> You're too ugly. Get out of here. Um, <laughs> Goat. So my daughter, my daughter's four, and she made me a little nervous yesterday because um, we were at this park playing with other friends from her preschool, and she saw a woman who was wearing a ton of makeup, a little too much makeup, Ooh. one of those, you know, like just like dripping in makeup. And my daughter said, "Wow, she's so pretty, so pretty," because my daughter loves makeup and the idea of makeup. And my wife was like, oh, really? What, you know, what, what, what makes her pretty? My daughter was like, oh, just all that stuff on her face. She's so pretty. <laughs> and then my daughter said, my next birthday party, I'm only going to invite the pretty people. <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> uh, so apparently, <laughs> apparently she will stand at the door. Dad, <laughs> you are invited. I know. It's like, will I make the cut? That's what I have to find uh -huh. out for next time. You know, as you walk up to the party, you've got like a, you've got like a present, right? The little four-year-old walking up to a party with a present, and then there's a person at the door saying, "Sorry, not pretty enough. We'll take the present though. Go away." Um, <laughs> so it goes. Therein lies the metaphor of American culture. Um, so it goes. It's a paradox that doesn't make sense. The wounded deer leaps highest. The example with the satyr or the satyr was someone came to the house and was very cold, and so knocked on the door to come inside. The satyr welcomed him in, and when the person came in, the person was blowing on his hands. It's so cold out there. The satyr said, why are you blowing on your hands? His answer, to warm them up, because they're so cold. The satyr said, oh, I'll give you some hot soup that will warm you up. Put the hot bowl of soup in front of the visitor. The visitor began blowing on the soup, the satyr said, why are you blowing on the soup? To cool it down. He said, you're an idiot. Get out of my house. In fact, that's not idiotic. That's a paradox. How is it actually true? How can you blow on your hands to... Hot soup and cold hands. How can you blow on your hands to warm them up and blow on your soup to cool it down? Because the temperature of the air that you're blowing is in between the hot and the cold. Precisely. If your hands are below the... 96 or whatever your temperature is coming out of your mouth, then it will warm them up. If your soup is above that, it will cool it down. It's a paradox, because it seems contradictory. What? But it's actually true. It's like the well, line isn't, isn't a true paradox actually impossible? 
well, the par paradox is true. I thought a paradox was something that literally can't happen. No, a paradox is the pr a paradox presents a problem because it seems to be something that can't happen, but yet it actually is true. It's an apparent contradiction versus just a contradiction. Like the time one, where you cut time in half and half and half and half and half and half, and it seems like it would go on forever, but it just passes. I don't know how to answer that. I do know that the time travel paradox is seeing oneself because it seems to be an actual impossibility, but it's an apparent contradiction. It looks like it's true. The line from the book was with Alexander Pope, where he said, to damn with what? Praise. Faint praise. If you praise someone, you, you're not damning them. To damn someone is to say, you know, you're horrible, you're atrocious, I will never visit one of your plays again. But if you damn them with faint praise, what are you doing? Think of, you're at a, um, you're at a play in the audience. Is it like a backhanded compliment? Kind of, kind of. And after the play, during the applause, how do you applaud? If you did not like it, you're going to give it a faint praise. Technically, you're clapping, but the way in which you're clapping indicates that it was not very good at all. Faint praise. If someone says, how was the movie? And you say, it was all right. You're basically saying the movie was bad. It was not worth watching. But you're doing it in such a way that it appears to be praising it, but in fact, you're not praising it. You're damning it with faint praise. It is a paradox paradoxical situation. The paradox here is that the wounded deer is the one leaving highest. I won't believe it's okay. I've heard the hunter tell. Okay, so who's our speaker? Very simply. I. Someone who what? Who has heard a hunter tell a story about a deer. Okay, that's it. That's our speaker in our occasion. I've heard the hunter tell, and now here's what the hunter is telling them. The wounded deer leaves highest, tis but the ecstasy of death. What's ecstasy, other than the drug? What does it mean? Good elation. <sighs> Burst of elation, ecstasy, ah, joy, whoo, ecstasy of death, and then the break is still. Presumably what's going to happen to this wounded deer after he leaves the highest? Come back. You die. A dead deer, a dead deer. That's some venison stew right there. That is are you quoting Troutline? <laughs> no. Is that your impression? No, no, Troutline, I, I, I cannot do justice to the, the Trout. Um, oh God, whose really, intellect and humor is on a different level altogether. I really wish I could have just heard what you guys talk about. Just, ah, uh, I wish I, mm, okay. He's, he's a funny guy. <laughs> Tis but the ecstasy of death and then the break is still. So, the hunter is basically saying, you know what's weird? Wounded deer often pretend like they're not wounded. They leap highest, but it's just that last surge of adrenaline before they die, and then everything is still. It's like sometimes in the movie where the person is wounded, and deadly wounded, but has just enough energy for that one last heroic act. Like Beowulf. Like Beowulf. <sighs> the ecstasy of death, and then the break is still. Example one, wounded deer. Example two, the smitten rock that gushes. What? The hecky bell. The what? What? What did you say? Does anyone know the biblical story what about the rock yeah, that and gushes? Yeah, Moses uh, split the rock and then wasn't allowed to go to uh, Jericho. Okay, you're combining stories. So Moses well, broke yeah. the commandment, placards, and then wasn't able to. But what did he oh, do yeah. rock? Well, he made Staff, yeah. rock, water. boom, water comes gushing out of the rock. Yeah, yeah. What? That doesn't happen. That's not supposed to happen. It's a rock. The smitten rock that gushes. The trampled steel that springs. 
Now again, it's Emily Dickinson, so we don't know for sure, but the image I have in my mind, the visual imagery, is of one of those bear traps. The trampled steel. It looks like it's been walked over, it looks like it's a piece of garbage, just like steel there, and all of a sudden, boom! That trampled steel that springs. It doesn't look like it would do that. That's the whole point. You cover it up. It looks like a little piece of steel, and you step on it, and boom, it springs. Done. Ow as they say. A cheek is always redder just where the that hurt more than I wanted it to. <laughs> just where the hectic stains. My cheek red? A little bit? I don't want to do it again. You can try it. You could smack some on the face. You. Smack some on the face. Smack some on the face. The point is this. If you smack someone on the cheek, that cheek is going to be red, and if you hit them really hard, there will be fingers on the cheek, and that's what's really kind of cool. So, <laughs> and you've got finger marks. A cheek is always redder just where the hectic stings. We're kind of confused at this point. We have a series of paradoxes, a series of apparent contradictions that are actually true. Trampled steel that springs. You have a, a smitten rock that gushes. You have a deer who's wounded and dying but leaps high. What is going on here? And then you get to this final stanza with the answer, the solution, the central purpose in a single line. Mirth is the male of anguish. This all comes down to denotation. What is mirth? Like happiness? Happiness. Joy. Mirth is joy. Mirth is the male. We're not talking about the post office here. Chain mail. Chain mail. What does chain mail do? Protect. Protects you. It guards you. Think of the, the Beowulf picture here. And by the way, this is the back of the head. You didn't go into battle like this. That would be very awkward. You we'll get to fight. Back of the head. Chain mail. Armor. Protection. Body armor. Mirth is the chain mail of anguish. Happiness is what we use to protect ourselves from deep sadness. Lest what? In which a cautious arm, lest anybody spy the blood, and you're hurt, they exclaim. So that nobody can see that you're actually hurt. Someone makes fun of you. You got two options. And I'm talking about the kind of This is why you laugh, cried. This is it. This is exactly it. If it legitimately hurts, and I mean legitimately hurts, I'm talking like seventh grade, lunch table selection, you go down to sit with your so-called friends, and they spend the entire lunch bill teasing you about how you're gay, and you like it in the butt. What? Did this happen to you? And the whole lunch bill. 35 minutes of this. This is 35 <laughs> minutes. And they're like, hi, oh, Carter likes it. Hey, Carter. Hey, Carter, if you're a little gay boy, no gay boy. 35 minutes. Why? Two options. Why Two options. This was every day. Oh my god. Why didn't I go to the parents and ask? Because there's only two other options. I could sit. <laughs> Could sit with all the, the crippled kids. <laughs> <laughs> you guys had enough to make them a table. Well, you know, I mean, there was also like the, um, the mentally challenged, okay. you know, the, the yeah. kind of table, the handicap table, and then you had all the cool kid table. I had chosen the kind of preppy kid table because that's kind of where you know where I, I was most of the time. And, uh, and and there you know there it was because every day they would pick someone at the table to pick on and to mess with, and for the last two weeks it had been Eric Cash, because when you messed with Eric, you would see occasionally he would start to you know. And once he even got up and ran off, oh. boom, done. So then it turned to me for an entire week. And I had two options. Option one was to run off and cry in the corner. How would they have responded? Worse. The you think they would come up and say, Stephen, I'm so sorry for teasing you. We were wrong. Please forgive us. It's junior high, people. 
If I got up and did that and showed them that their words had damaged me, my gosh, open neck for the kill for crying out loud. Stop, guys, stop. Oh, no cry baby now, now too, no cry baby Carter. Hoochie booty booty, why don't you run into a mommy? Hoochie booty, you're so cute when you cry. You're so cute. Look at you. This hey, is everybody, crazy. Carter's crying. I could do that. And that's what I wanted to do. But instead, what did I do? <laughs> I laughed it off. Like, ha, huh, yeah, uh huh. No, sure, yeah, really. Okay, guys, yeah, that's so funny. Because otherwise, they would see that I was damaged. If I took the chain mail off, they would see, my gosh, she's bleeding. And then it's, we've got it now. <laughs> what is this poem suggesting about human nature? It's like a deer that's been shot. Well, there's, there's two aspects of human nature. There's the aspect of the victim and the aspect of the person doing it. And what is the nature of the victim? To hide it. To hide the hurt. And what is the nature of the person causing the pain? To exploit it. To exploit it. These are two key elements of human nature, and they are brought about so beautifully in this poem, and basically boiled down to that one line. Mirth is the male of anguish. We have all been there, we have all seen it, and honestly, probably from both sides. We know exactly what this is talking about. And some people stick it out so much better than others. And sometimes you just want to tell someone, dude, pretend like it doesn't bother you. Because otherwise, it will get worse. You know it will get worse. And you know the kind of person who is incapable of pretending like it doesn't bother them. You know? I mean, just think about it. I am trying, huh? There's always someone who shows, and as a result, becomes an easy target. Oh my god. Hmm. Yeah, an easy target. <laughs> so this ultimately is a key component here of human nature. If we boil this down to central purpose, think about the truths it says about humanity. Uh, humanity is simultaneously engaged in its attempt to cover up its emotional pain and to exploit the emotional pain of others, thus the central purpose but it takes some time to get there. You have to look at what's going on here, which is an overarching paradox. You have to identify the denotation of various words like mirth and male, and then you have to put that together with what's going on and what's actually being said. But once you do, poetry becomes rather straightforward. Here's what we're gonna do next. The poem that I have for you next is a somewhat lengthy poem, but it is very down to earth. You're going to look at this and know exactly what the poem is talking about. And this is going to function as our case study for this class. We are going to go through this poem, I kid you not, line by line by line by line by line by line by line. so far. The four questions. These aspects here, which we're going to continue to add to this list, and we are going to figure out what's going on in this poem, and we're going to start with the title, Ex-Basketball Player. Jeremy, what comes to your mind when I say that? Ex-Basketball Player. Um, he used to play basketball. Okay, very literal interpretation. Thank you. Ola, connotations stemming off of that. Why? Why is he an ex-basketball player? Let's think of some ideas. He has a knee injury. Knee injury, blew out his knee senior year, he's off the team. What's another possibility, Andrew? He's not good at basketball. Not good at basketball, he's done, he's kicked off the team. Vince? He got cut from his high school basketball team. Okay, ex-basketball player. You know what? Washed up pro. Washed up pro. All of these are distinct possibilities. We don't know which one it is yet, but these are our connotations starting off. Now let me explain, starting off here. If you could, put your name at the top of this, because you're going to be turning this in at the end of class today. And I want to see a lot of comments on here. We as a group are going to annotate this line by line. And in the margins, around, on the sides, I want you to write down and circle and mark up what we're saying. For this reason, primarily, you are going to do this exact thing this weekend with a poem of your choice. And then after you do this, you're going to write a paper wherein you spell out the analysis of that poem. And at the end of class today, I'm going to tell you what I want that to look like. How long is that paper going to be? 
two pages. Okay. And in doing that, this is our workshop. So we're going to do the hard work here, and then you're going to go do this with a different poem. So let's start with line one. Pearl Avenue runs past the high school lot. Pearl Avenue runs past the high school lot. Personification. Personification of a road. Good. The word runs is a verb we usually associate with humans or living creatures. Pearl Avenue is a road, not a living creature. Personification of this road, which means the road is more than just a road, which means we should look at the name of the road, which is what? Pearl Avenue. Tell me about pearls, Vince. Uh, they're shiny. They come from oysters. Uh, they sit in oysters' mouths. They're very valuable. Uh, they make good jewelry. Precisely. How does one arrive at the creation of a pearl? Dirt. First, dirt. There's, first there's irritation. There's irritation, there's the chafing, there's the dirt, there's a long period of time. A pearl is created. How does one get to the pearl? Open up that oyster. Pry it open. Take out the pearl, and you're good. That word will be highly significant here. So just remember that. Pearl Avenue runs like a what? Person. Like a, like a basketball player. Pearl Avenue runs past or after the what? High school lot. In other words, it keeps going after the high school lot. Now, which of the, the connotations of the title are we now thinking? In our mind, just from this first line, it runs past the high school lot. It goes past high school. He played basketball past high school. He played, he played basketball in high school. Maybe, right? He's an ex-basketball player. Just like you, after this next year, will be an ex-whatever. Play soccer? Maybe you play in college, maybe you won't. No. If you don't, you're an ex-soccer player starting next year. Starting one year from now. Ex-soccer player. Pearl Avenue runs past the high school lot. Line two. Bends with the trolley tracks. There's what? Trolley tracks. What do we call that? Let's circle the T's. Trolley tracks. Bends with the trolley tracks and stops. Cut off. Andrew, what's going through your mind? Stops. Cut off. Sounds kind of like cacophony. It is cacophony. The word cut is cacophony. Let's circle it and write that. Cacophony. Cut off. No, what's going on in your mind here? Pearl Avenue goes this way and this way and then stops. Cut off. That's about it. That's all I'm thinking. It's about a street that goes and then stops. Hold on. Sounds like you have an theory. It's called Pearl Avenue. What would we expect after Pearl Avenue? that this avenue would go all the way to New York City. It's Pearl Avenue. It might as well be called Broadway Street, or Main Street, or Montgomery Road, for crying out loud. I think it goes forever. Oh, man. What does Pearl Avenue do? Uh, now, keep that thought in mind. It says stops, cut off, before it has a chance to go two blocks. People, these first three lines are about a road, but my gosh, they're about so much more than a road. Can you see the symbolism here? Let's write that one up here too. What is a symbol? Something that means what it is, but also symbolizes. Precisely. It's different than a metaphor. Metaphor has literal and figurative. A, sim a symbol is an actual thing. It's a person, it's an object, it's a notion, it's something but it has greater meaning as well. Pearl Avenue is a daggone road, people. But what else is it? A journey. It's a person, and probably what person? An ex-basketball player. An ex-basketball player who possibly has a lot of promise and potential, like a pearl, but then what? Stops. Cut off before it has a chance to go two blocks. Look at that wording before it has a chance. 
Well, obviously, the road is not like, I'm going, I'm going. What? No! Roads don't do that, people. The highway don't care. The highway don't care. Yes, I did go there. But I do. I do. And I'm just going to pause there, so you get the tune in your head. I don't know the song, sucker. <laughs> ha! Ha! That hurts, but I'm going to cover it up. Male. There. Male. <laughs> well, you just told us <laughs> <Laughter. that hurts. laughs> Murph. Hey, Mr. Carter, are you going to cry? No? <laughs> Don't you love that question? Are you going to cry? If what are you going to person says yes. <laughs> yes, right now. <laughs> no. Maybe I will. The question implies a negative answer because of the tone in which it's asked. Are you going to cry? No one ever says yes. Just not now. <laughs> Later I will. Tonight when I'm alone in my room, holding my dolls. What? <laughs> All 30 of them. <laughs> Tickling them, so well. and tickling me. Yes. Why would you cry while they're in your arms? I think that's the safest place that you should be yeah. at peace with your dolls. I remember, this is unrelated to any of this, but I remember when I was a freshman in, in high school and I had joined choir simply because choir had the most attractive women in the entire school. I'm talking, they were, they were amazing. And they were all juniors and seniors, so I joined choir. Fortunately, there was no requirement to join choir. You didn't actually have to sing well. So I joined choir, and I remember, um, I, don't, I don't know why, but one of, the, uh, one of the girls, she was a junior. <laughs> she, I, I, again, I don't remember the context. I just remember, her name's Maya. I just remember she said, for whatever reason, she asked me if I had a yardstick. I don't know why. I don't. I just remember the question. I just remember the question, and I remember thinking. You know, this is going on really for a minute. Thinking, I gotta make an impression, and I gotta be funny. Because that's all I've got going for me is my humor. I, I obviously am not a football player. I'm in choir for crying out loud, and, uh, and so I gotta win her over in this one response. And so I'm thinking in my mind, wouldn't it be funny <laughs> if I? If I ask her if she's talking about a backyard stick or a front yard stick, <laughs> yeah, if it's like a yard stick, you know. So, and I thought she would get that it was a joke. So I said, I said, well, Maya, do, are you looking for a front yard stick or a backyard stick? <laughs> and she paused and looked at me, and she's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that should be my first clue to not try anymore. Uh, she said, I don't know. She said, is there a difference between the two? Well, no, you idiot. It's a yardstick. I was trying to be funny. And then there's that moment where you're like, she doesn't get it. Do I either explain it with a joke, or do I just keep going with this thing? <laughs> oh, I can't be going. <laughs> I said, well, I actually buy it. There is a, uh, there's a two and a half inch difference between the backyard stick and the front yard stick. So I was just curious which one you wanted because I didn't want to lead you astray with, with either one. And I kept talking. And I have no idea what I was even talking about. To and she just day. looked at me like, and then walked away. And I remember as she was walking away, I said something like, I can go get that for you. <laughs> just walked oh, away. No. Walked away. To this day, she Before know I had a chance to go two blocks, she walked away. Yeah, but you ruined that for yourself. That <laughs> was your chance. Okay, maybe Pearl Avenue ruined it for itself. Maybe Pearl Avenue is like, I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. And then the road paper person's like, no, you're not. Boom. Done. What? Cut off. See, here's how we know this is a symbol. First of all, the clue was personification with runs. And then, the wording of, before it has a chance. That's not how you talk about roads. Third clue, the name of the road, Pearl Avenue, really? And also, in a poem, every single word has significance. Why name Pearl Avenue and not West Street? Or Lincoln Street, or something? 
Perl admin. You put these two things together and you're like, ding, 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 this is a symbol. And so it's a literal road, but what is its figurative representation? So we're thinking maybe this is meant to represent in some way the X basketball player. We go on to the next line. At Colonel Nikomsky Plaza, period. Births Garage. Okay. If I say to you, go down to Births Garage, what kind of a garage or car place are you picturing in your mind? Car garage. A scary one. <laughs> this is Births Garage, people. I mean, it's like, Picture of the guy coming out, overalls, no shirt on underneath, right? Hands in the back pockets, some chaw. <laughs> I can't even, <laughs> I can't even do the chaw thing. Um, I saw a guy last night with some chaw at the park where my daughter said the woman was pretty. And he had an empty 20 ounce bottle of Mountain Dew that had a bunch of brown liquid at the bottom. And I was like, what is that? And then I looked up at him and he's like, and I was like, ah, uh, that's not Mountain Dew. <laughs> so, Murph walks out. Yeah, brown mirrored car. You know, I'm going to be like, uh, no, I'm looking for the grocery store and then hop in the car and drive off. But, Burst Garage. This is here, right next to Colonel McComsky Plaza. Burst Garage is on the corner facing west. Why are we given that detail? I mean, who the heck cares? Are we carrying a compass around with us on Pearl Avenue? No, that doesn't matter. It does, though. Why? It sees the sunset. What is the West? In literature, in, in figurative significance? Freedom. 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 California. Our literal interpretation, thank you, Jeremy. Which, for many of us, and way back when, was a notion of what? Adventure. Adventure? Hope. Best. Hope. Life is peaceful. And money. What? California Gold Rush. What? Head west, young man. The life of adventure awaits you. Burr's garage is on the corner facing west, and there, most days, note that it doesn't say every day, most days, you'll find Flick Webb who helps birth out. What is Flick's employment at this garage, most likely? Mechanic. Probably a part-time mechanic. And why do I say part-time? Most days. Most days, and he helps Berth out. The dude doesn't even own the garage. It's Berth's garage. Flick Webb works there. Presumably, who is Flick Webb? Dax basketball Who presumably did what? Play no, basketball. Man. Probably played basketball in high school, and then what? Had a set. Then probably nothing. Because what does he do now? Works, Works part-time at a garage that faces west. So what does he get to see on a regular basis? All his dreams. All my hopes, all my dreams. Oh. Just like Pearl Avenue. Here I go. Here I go. Ah. Now granted, <clears throat> this is one stanza and it's six lines long. And you could argue that I have read into this stanza far more than what is actually there. I would argue right back, what? The, it's the creator. You haven't read enough. Creator not cre or created not creator. I would argue that it is there. You just have to look closer. And when you look at it, you start to realize that through the symbolism, through the language, through the associations, you can pick up all these things. And by the way, speaking of connotations, suggested meanings, Look at the name Flick Web. What is a flick? The flick of the wrist. What is a flick? Brief. Both a basketball connotation and also a brief what? Brief motion. Brief insignificant dismissal. If you flick something away, and what's a web? Spud web. Spider. Spud web. Anthony. The internet. Web. Think of the connotations of spider web in the tone five, that we have just established. Nine and seven. What is it? Caught. Caught or stuck as an ex basketball player. I want you to picture a small town, small town movie thing, Friday Night Lights. Any fans that show? Okay. No. Think. Remember 
the Titans. Uh, okay. Think. No, I, I've seen it. Okay. Like Any it. small I town scenario <laughs> where everybody knows everyone, and there's always the kids who want to get out and leave, but there's always a the sense of being trapped, like you're trapped in a web. Flick web. Look at the next stanza. Flick stands tall. Basketball. Yeah. Yeah, he does. That's right, fool. He stands tall. Prepositional phrase. Among what? The idiot pumps. What are the pumps, probably? Other mechanics. People who are at the campus. Literal pumps. He's at a garage. Like, tire pumps. My guess is other mechanics. Okay. We'll just put a question mark there. Idiot pumps, so that's kind of sad for other mechanics. <laughs> what do you do? Flick stands tall when he's compared to the pumps. What are the pumps? Well, here they are. Five on a side. Why is that significant? Basketball. Basketball. Five on a side. Five on a team. Five playing. Five on a side. Five pumps on a side. The old bubble head style. Uh, it's a gas pump. It's a gas pump. A gasoline pump with the old head at the top, right? E S S O S O station, the old style pump, and if you look close, those things almost look human. Bubble head, tubes coming out like arms. It's actually not if you look close; it's if you look. Up. That's what I meant. I meant the opposite of looking close. <laughs> yeah. Look far away and squint, and you're like, maybe it's a human. I don't know. <laughs> the point is this: when you compare Flick to a bunch of gas station pumps, dude looks tall. But you have to compare it to gas station pumps, people. Man, the old bubblehead style, their rubber elbows hanging loose and low. There's more alliteration, loose, low. And what does that sound like? Elbows hanging loose and low. The uh, actual pumps. Mm -hmm. And what else? Five on a side, hanging loose and low. Defensive standards. It's like basketball players. Almost like Flick is trapped in a web of his past. Ding, 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 ding. These are the kind of thoughts we have going through our head when we analyze them. Hanging loose and low, one's nostrils are two S's, and his eyes an E and O. Why are we given that detail? Gas station. Like we said earlier, the S-O pumps. E-S-S-O. And one is squat, without a head at all. This would be a pump that lost the top part. And then here we have a little joke. More like a football type. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. Got the football player. Basketball player. So we're just little, little, little sports show. Uh, I thought I that was supposed to be referring to that. I didn't get to the football player. <laughs> Mirth. You gonna cry? Mirth. I feel like that poem is specifically applicable to Noah Gardner's because you're the hunter. I think he Better than that in the The rest of us are the deer. I think he hides the most. I think oh, all no. of his Aren't the hunters oh. always overcompensated? Yes. That's so what am I overcompensating for, man? I must shoot the poor deer because I myself have to hide my vulnerability. What if I ever hurt you? Such as Many sitting in the I back of the come? class because I don't want to be the center of attention. Oh, claiming it's because I don't want to mess up your video, or is it that you don't want to be on the camera? I li I told you you I wanted more don't space. Don't want your oh. face spread to the world. No, I just don't want my face Vimeo now. account, oh. Oh. which has had two views so far. <laughs> Jeremy <Myself> and Jeremy. <laughs> Well on its way, people. Well on its way. <laughs> that is actually like the saddest number. It's worse than one. Because <laughs> one person, uh, one other person saw it and decided not to tell anybody else. <laughs> Perhaps. No. You'll have three views after today. That's right. Ben Narvel. Get in on the video action. Third stanza. Once, Flip played for the high school team, the Wizards. Andrew, what do we see in that line that's significant? Um, well, once is just confirming that he doesn't play for them anymore. Once is a is a word that we often use in what sort of beginning or openings? Once upon a time. Which is our classic opening of a fairy tale. 
something kind of from the past that feels like it was possibly never even true, once upon a time. And then our final word in that line is what? Wizards. Wizards. Magic. Magical. The wizards. He played for the high school team, the Wizards. This next line has what we're going to call syntactical significance. Because remember, syntax is the word that we use to describe word order, sentence length, and any aspect of punctuation. Watch what the speaker does here. He was good, colon, in fact, the best. Instead of starting with, he was the best, the speaker says, he was good, in fact, the best. Signifying what? Out of everyone. How can I make an argument that this suggests a passing of time? This use of syntax. Because it takes you a second to remember that he had the best? He was good. In fact, he was the best. Obviously, as time is going on, this memory is starting to fade. Otherwise, the speaker would have started with he was the best. So this just shows, on some level, the fading aspect of high school glory. I remember when he was good. Wait a minute, he was the best. The syntactical significance is clear from the use of the colon and the comma, which suggests a failure to completely remember at first. Then it goes on to say, in 46, he bucketed 390 points. Why does it not say scored? A couple reasons. Number one, very literally. What are they called? He dumped them. Yeah, I mean, he bucketed. We're talking about a basketball net. We're talking about a hoop. We're talking about a circle. So a bucket. He bucketed. Also, on some level, you could argue that this kind of minimizes his achievement. How? What does bucketed almost sound like? Well, score has the connotation of like a winner, a real winner. Yes. Bucketed is kind of lowly. Bucketed is kind of like toss it in. Like you bucket apples for crying out loud. You put a bucket on the ground and you throw the apples in there. It takes away or minimizes the accomplishment in some way just through that word choice. And then it says, a county record still. How can that be read in two ways? Well, because it's a record, but it's just for the county. A state, no. A region, no. A, a county record, still. It's like you said earlier, that backhanded compliment. Oh, yeah. oh, you've got the county record? Your hair looks so good when you wear such an ugly shirt. <laughs> Mert, man. Mert, Mert, come on. Then it says, the ball loved flick. This is another aspect of syntax. Long sentence, long sentence, long sentence, long sentence, the ball loved flick. This abrupt, short sentence grabs our attention, and it reverses the typical order of subject-object. How does this further, further the personification we saw in the first line? Flick doesn't have the ball, the ball is true. The ball, who cannot love, loves foot. Instead of flick loves the ball, it almost makes it sound like what? Flick didn't have to put any effort in. Precisely. It did it for him. Um, quick sub point. Um, yesterday in the car, we were talking about sports with my daughter because she's starting to play soccer. And she said, what other sports take a ball? And so we said, well, baseball, football, and all this stuff. And I said, you know, Alyssa, the greatest sport doesn't, and that's cross country, that's running. To which my wife said, that's right, Steve, your sport doesn't take any balls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, so that's what I gotta put up. She calls <laughs> you Steve, that's hilarious, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part that was funny. <laughs> oh, no one, no one, no one. 
So that'll be our t-shirt this year, gentlemen. Our sport takes the ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get more people. And that will be it, right? Um, it's so, true. Okay. Um, so there's that. Long sleeve or short sleeve? Um, we'll probably, probably the hoodie. <laughs> so we can just bury our heads in shame. Um, in mirth. Bury our heads in Our hoodie hood. is the male. <laughs> so, yes. The ball of Flick. I saw him rack up 38 or 40 in one home game. His hands were like wild birds. Now keep this image in mind. We have the simile. His hands were like wild birds. Now Ola just brought up the question, who's the speaker? What do we know about the speaker so far? Well, he knows Flick. He or she knows Flick and watched Flick when? It, it, they don't necessarily know Flick, they know of Flick. Yes. In high school. In high school. In Older or younger? Not so. It seems like it's younger or the same age. Could have been Flick's younger sibling. It could have been. I feel like if it was Flick's dad. younger sibling, there'd be a greater sense of connection. Yeah. You find my brother, Flick. This is probably just someone who lives in the town. Yeah. Sees him around. Oh, yeah. It's Flick, right? He, 46, man. I saw him bucket 390 points. The ball loved him. His hands. He'd be like, wow, birds. Another backhanded compliment. How? How is that one? It's not really trained. It's more like training. It's not really a, a set pattern or rhythm. It's almost like going everywhere, every which way. And it worked for him. Why? Maybe in high school. Yeah. And who loved it? Oh. The ball. The wizard's man's magic. Crazy. But now look at this. He never learned to trade, he just sells gas. Look at the combination of those two words with the negative connotation. Never, just. Two of the most depressing words in the English language. You're just a kid. <clears throat> Excuse me? You'll never do this. What? That's right. That was fighting words. He never learned to trade, he just sells gas, comma, checks oil, and changes flats. Oh, dream big, Flick. I bet he had big dreams. Now look at him. Next line. Once in a while, as a gag, as a joke, as a laugh, he dribbles an inner two. But most of us remember anyway. His hands are fine and nervous on the lug wrench. What kind of hands is Flick Webb have? Like wild birds. Wild birds, man. Basketball hands. What's he using them for now? Pipes. Hard to work. A lug wrench. You don't need wild bird hands for a lug wrench. It says it makes no difference to the lug wrench, though. The lug wrench don't care. The lug wrench don't care. Mm -hmm. What kind of hands do you need for a lug wrench? Lug wrench hands. <laughs> You need hands like my father. Barley. Dude's got hands. Black. Black. Dude's like, dude grabs, dude doesn't need a lug wrench. My father in law goes up to the car and he's like, bloop. And I'm like, bloop. It's highly embarrassing. Uh, also, they were over at our house and uh, we had a jar of pickles. My wife's like, Steve, can you open this? Oh no. I know, I know. And I'm like, Ray, my father-in-law, is like, what you got there? I'm like, really? He's like, trying to open that jar of pickle there. I'm like, I, you know, I, no, I got it, I got it. Let me see the jar of pickles. I got this. Let me see the jar of pickles. Fine. Beep. There you go. All right, good thing. About Do you get the sense that he's disappointed? <laughs> uh, it's getting harder. Okay, the thing about his. Wild bird hands and uh, the lug wrench, like his hands don't matter because everything that they touch did the work for him. Yeah, except with the lug wrench, you need to do that work. The ball loved it. Lug wrench? I don't care. Look at me, I'm a lug wrench for crying out I'm not going to do anything special. Look at this next stanza, that's where it all comes down to so the tone he hits you over the head with a sledgehammer. Off work, he hangs around May's luncheonette. Every town has one of these people. May's Luncheonette, it's the diner. It's where everybody goes and hangs out. May's Luncheonette. 
and you better believe May will be there just like Bert will be at the garage. May's luncheonette. Now listen to this description. Grease gray and kind of coiled. What coils itself? Spring. Spring? Snake? Something ready to do something. Nervous. Ready. Go. Kind of coiled. Except what's he doing? Playing pinball. He's playing pinball. Ooh. Dude went from playing basketball to pinball. That is what has happened to our ex-basketball player. He plays pinball, like we said yesterday or, or Tuesday. A lot of sound, a lot of fury, signifying nothing. Life is a hound, but life is also a game of pinball. Game done. Cool, I fun of college. Smokes those thin cigars. What kind of people smoke those thin cigars? Old men. Oh, okay, old men, yes. Losers. Pretentious losers. <laughs> I really wanted to say some lace. Just to <laughs> like, see what your reaction would be. Just like, Mexican. <laughs> what? No! Mess with abuelo. Abu actually, abuelo's not the one you gotta worry about. Theo Beto? I, he was, <laughs> was detained, <laughs> he worked for the Mexican government, I swear this is true, he worked for the Mexican government, government, and there, if you're suspected of corruption, they don't have to investigate you before throwing you in jail, so they just threw him in jail for a really long time, <laughs> found out that he didn't actually do anything and released him, that was it. Who is this? My, my tío, my, my uncle, well, my great uncle, it's Abuelo's brother. This is, I am legitimately Mexican, okay, dude? I'll show you a family tree. Well, you showed me a picture. I know. I don't know. It's a great She didn't know. Is, is this, was it Photoshop? Did you see this? Well, I didn't see him in the picture. I just saw oh. it. I can get a picture of uh, me when I was very young. With Smokes those thin family. cigars, which is not a race thing. <laughs> Those thin, like, like Swisher Sweets people. People who don't have money. These are the ones you get at the gas people station who have a little plastic tip on them. Okay. Smokes those thin cigars. Nurses lemon phosphates. Ooh. Okay. He nurses them like he's sipping a martini. It's a lemon soda. Flick seldom says a word to May. It's too good for her. Seldom says a word to May. He just nods beyond her face. Toward bright, applauding tiers or stadiums of what? Neck wafers. Candy. Mims. Behind May at the counter, you got candy. Flick went from having bright, applauding tiers of adoring fans, and now his fans are mindless concoctions of high fructose corn syrup stored at May's luncheonette as he plays pinball. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down with Flint Webb, this ex-basketball player whose glory days were just that. And like Pearl Avenue, he runs cut off before he has a chance to go two blocks. And in that, we see the central purpose this stalled, this cut off, this example, this microcosm of human existence for those who have so much potential, but yet now use a lug wrench. Alas, so it goes. Let me explain what you're going to do for Tuesday. First, read half of Jane Eyre. Try your best to get through it. What is half, like 257? You find the copy I gave you, you read halfway through. <laughs> Chapter 20, sorry. You'll figure it out. Then, your paper, I do not have a piece of paper for you to explain, so here's the explanation. You pick a poem from the Sound and Sense textbook that we have not talked about. It has to be from that textbook? Yes. It should be a poem of at least 12 lines in length. Analyze it thoroughly, looking for these aspects. Write a two-page essay. Your thesis statement is the central purpose. So introduce the poem, talk about it. Your thesis is the poem's central purpose, and the rest of the paper 
is you explaining how the central purpose comes about via the figurative language, the cacophony, the euphony, the similes, the metaphors, the paradox, the tone, the imagery, the illusion. Use these devices to show us how that central purpose comes about. Submit it to turnitin.com by Tuesday at 8.30, and you're good to go. Enjoy. Yeah, on your way out, put the poem up there on the table if you would. That's a nice little participant.